Lu Xun's rage spilled out in his writing, but it would take two men of action to turn China's rising anger in a revolutionary direction. Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong. Their struggle for control over China would consume the country for the next 20 years. In 1924, Mao Zedong was just a young communist organizer trying to harness the rising anger of peasants in China's countryside. Chiang Kai-shek was the man with the power. With financial backing from underworld groups and arms from the Soviet Union, he used whatever means he could to free China from the grip of the warlords. Chiang Kai-shek formed an uneasy alliance with the communists and led the military campaign against the warlords. Picking up thousands of recruits along the way, Chiang's forces defeated 34 warlord armies in their path as they pushed north from Canton to the Yangtze River Valley. By the spring of 1927, Chiang was ready to take Shanghai. As Chiang neared the city, Shanghai communists led 600,000 workers in a general strike. They seized railway depots and police stations. When the Guomindang troops entered the city, the workers and communists rejoiced, but their jubilation was short-lived. On April 13th, Chang's Gomindang troops opened fire on demonstrators, killing nearly a hundred workers and students. In Shanghai, Beijing, and Canton, Guomindang armies rounded up suspected communists and executed them. Lu Xun watched as China continued to devour itself. In 1928, one year after the massacre, Lu Xun sought refuge in Shanghai because his writing had made him powerful enemies among the warlords and the Guomindang. It was ironic that the only city that offered freedom for Chinese writers was the city most dominated by foreign powers. The Guomindang controlled the Chinese sections of the city. But the foreign powers ruled the concessions, where the sounds of nightclubs drowned out the patter of beggars and gunfire. In Shanghai, everyone danced to a very international beat. It was a city of cross currents between past and present. Foreigners and Chinese, capitalism and communism. Dance halls, jazz, the whole cultural paraphernalia of the Roaring Twenties were there. You have a symphony staffed by white Russians with an Italian conductor. Uh, you have uh, bookstores, you have coffee houses, uh, Russian soup and uh, American pastry and, uh, you know, Japanese sushi and everything. So, in a way, that was the only city for somebody like Lu Xun to live in. Lu Xun was a cosmopolitan figure who wanted to ventilate China's prison house with foreign art and ideas. He lived in the Japanese concession, and many friends were Japanese. He debated with Western intellectuals like George Bernard Shaw, in Shanghai, Lu Xun wanted to use international ideas to strengthen Chinese nationalism. Sometimes he was a bit too extreme in his criticism of Chinese traditions, and he accepted Western progress wholesale. But he was fervent about the independence and liberation of the Chinese people, to which he had devoted his entire life. In China, Yes, there was imperialism. Yes, there was a colonial presence. But China was not colonized. So the Lu Xun really did not have a sense of being you know, a member of a colonized nation. There was enough pride in him, or in a possibility of a Chinese solution. In 
1931, Lu Xun's dreams of liberation were shattered when the Japanese bombed the Chinese section of Shanghai. It was a punishment for anti-Japanese protests. Suddenly, nationalist dreams of China and Japan were at war. Japan thought it needed what had made the Western powers strong, an empire. Dependent on resources and trade from China, Japan moved to annex the Chinese territory of Manchuria. The government gave Japanese farmers fertile Manchurian fields and full military protection. But the annexation of Manchuria did not solve Japan's problems. It deepened them. The exploitation of Chinese workers inflamed anti-Japanese feeling. The government and the big Zaibatsu companies poured money into Manchuria but got very little out. When conditions did not improve in Japan, many people blamed the greed of wealthy business leaders. Poor young military officers, many of whom came from the countryside, began to talk about radical solutions to Japan's problems. For inspiration, they turned to the words of Kitaiki. The people are their main force, and the emperor their commander. Remove the barriers which have separated the people from the emperor. Kitaiki was a, was a weird Japanese original. He was a populist, he was a socialist, he was also a fascist. He was an emperor worshiper. Uh, he was an anti-capitalist, but he was also anti-communist. Uh, and he thought that the hope for Japan lay in some kind of mysterious Japanese nationalization, uh, the product of young people uh, who were loyal to the emperor and who were against all these politicians who picked this idea up. Well, of course, it was the neo-fascist young officers of the 1930s. Mm-hmm. 